Thank you all for joining this event and um, a huge thank you, the biggest thank you uh, for our speaker, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron, um, joining us all the way from the US of A. Uh, and I should say that uh, that um, this is this is just a, a sequel, uh, um, uh, um, a taster for the, the, the real event this time next year when Lejeune's able to uh, to come to the, the college. Uh, Lejeune's been elected as one of our Bynum Tudor Fellows uh, of the college. I might say a bit more about that later if there's a time, if there's time. But it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Lejeune Montgomery Tabron, who is president and chief executive of the WK Kellogg Foundation, uh, which is a, a large charitable foundation um, based in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, which I had the great pleasure of uh, visiting when I first took up this role as president of Kellogg College. Um, Lejeune has, has uh, worked there for um, quite a, uh, a number of years um, and is now uh, president and chief executive having played various other roles uh, previously. Um, I should, should say something, I should explain that it's not a complete coincidence that uh, the college has got the same uh, name as the, the foundation. Um, our college, as you know, was formed in, in 1990. And for those of you who don't know, up until then, up until 1990, as a University of Oxford degree student, you actually weren't allowed to do paid work during term time. In other words, you couldn't be a, a part-time student. Uh, and when I tell people that, they say, well, technically that can't be true because you can't have a business school without an executive MBA where the executives are allowed to continue their careers. Uh, while studying. So I have to say, well, dear God, you don't think the University of Oxford would have permitted a business school in 1990, despite the fact that Harvard Business School and others had been successful for 100 years before then. Mm -hmm. So no, it was uh, in 1990, what's now Kellogg College was formed, then came the opportunity to, to study for degrees on a part-time basis, and then came the business school and increasing a recognition across the university that, that part-time study was a, a legitimate uh, mode of studying for a, a postgraduate uh, degree. It's still only postgraduate in, in Oxford. And Kellogg, as a result of that, has now become incredibly successful in terms of the number of students we have in, and being the most diverse and the most international uh, college in, in Oxford. Um, so we formed in 1990, and then in 1994, the, the college changed its name to Kellogg College in honor of the, the WK Kellogg Foundation. Um, because the foundation was so impressed at this, this work and opening up the University of Oxford to people who would otherwise not have been able to have the opportunity of, of studying here. And at the time, the foundation, the WK Keller Foundation strapline was helping people to help themselves. So they really liked this idea that people were going to be able to um, come to Kellogg College and study on a um, part-time basis. So welcome, Lejeune. It's a, it's a real honor and privilege to uh, have you um, with us and can I, having just said a very few words myself and maybe getting some of it, not yeah, kind of reports. Could, could, I wondered, Lejeune, could I ask you to start off? Yeah, <laughs> könnte ich auch, yeah. All right, someone's genau, also. um, Shabazz, are you able to mute other people? Somebody was talking. Anyway, sorry, Lejeune, could you just start by, by telling us a bit about the work of the WK Kellogg Foundation, you know, its history, its current focus and so on? Sure, thank you, Jonathan, and welcome everyone. And thank you, I'm honored to be here and present today. And I'm looking forward to coming back on campus next year. I'm hoping that everything is well and we are able to do that real soon. Um, but yes, uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation just recently celebrated its 90th anniversary. So we've been in existence over 90 years now, but we were founded by Will Keith Kellogg, the same founder of the Kellogg Company. Uh, but Will Keith had a vision, uh, and based on his own background, he wanted children everywhere to experience a world where they could all experience well being and happiness. And so he created this foundation uh, to serve uh, children everywhere uh, and to make sure that children are well, are happy, 
and our, our living and thriving environments. And um, so over the past 90 years, we've been in pursuit of that vision that Mr. Kellogg set for us. But we now understand that for children to thrive, uh, their families must be able to support them and take care of them and have a, a, a very stable environment. And then communities must be equitable so that families have opportunities to thrive and so therefore then children could thrive. And so we have been thinking about this context of children within families, within communities and communities making up the constructs of our world uh, and thinking about then how do we make the best impact for children? And we look at it through the lens of education. How do we improve outcomes for children in early childhood education as well as that entire continuum? We also look at it from a vantage point of health and health equity and how our children are faring, how communities and conditions support their health and well being. And then we also look at it from a vantage point of family economic security. How are the families thriving? Are they accessing livable wage opportunities? Whether it be entrepreneurship uh, or within uh, other structures of opportunity, we just want to make sure that the families can pursue their aspirations and dreams and then provide that stability and hope for their children. And just as you said, Jonathan, our value of helping people help themselves is still very much live and well at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And we know when we do that, uh, we know that children will result and, and benefit from that purpose. Um, and then finally, we have what we call the DNA of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And that is the lens by which we do all of this work. And our DNA has uh, three elements. One is leadership to the point of investing in people, because we know people create the communities, the systems, uh, the structures by which we live. So leadership is very key to us at the Kellogg Foundation. We also look at community engagement, how communities are coming together, building systems within their constructs where children and families can thrive. And our third element of our DNA is what we call in the United States racial equity. Uh, I know in every country, uh, the term race may not be used as well as it is understood today in the United States. But racial equity for us means that every child, regardless of color, ethnicity, uh, income, every child has an opportunity to thrive and the opportunities are bountiful for all children of all colors and races, ethnicities, gender, et cetera. And so I'll talk more about that during this uh, conversation, but our DNA of racial equity, community engagement and leadership will show up in how we think about improving outcomes for children. Great, thank you very much. And that's, um... Very impressive, and there's very strong synergies with uh, Kellogg College in almost everything he said there. Um, so I, I will, before too long, throw it open for, for questions, because um, I know that different, pe different people um, at this meeting will be involved in different aspects of what you've um, been talking about, about uh, communities and, and leadership and so on. I mean, lead leadership is a um, very interesting one. We, we always, uh, at Kellogg College, get a lot of, of questions uh, about leadership and, and requests for, for different activities on leadership because of the very different sort of nature of leadership that our um, uh, students and then alumni are involved in, remembering that a lot of our students are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, playing very interesting leadership roles, but in very different contexts and very different, uh, different ways you know, across the world. Um, and in terms of leadership, can I, can I start maybe by just asking about about yourself and, and your own sort of leadership journey, what, what your um, background was in, in coming to play the, the role that you currently are. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have, uh, I think, a very interesting story there. Um, 
But in many ways, I think the passion for my leadership today and my role as president and CEO of the Kellogg Foundation comes from my journey and um, the happenstance by which I became president. Uh, I come from uh, a very large family and I think a lot of my leadership capabilities came right there and started with my nine siblings and my my parents. So I'm one of 10 children. I'm actually number nine of 10 children. And uh, in that position, having to lead up and tell truth to power up, down and sideways, I, I think was the foundation of my leadership. And then after going through the university, I had determined that I wanted to be in corporate America as many people do and started to pursue a career in public accounting. Uh, And the opportunity to work for the Kellogg Foundation was one that was uh, presented to me. It wasn't one that I had pursued. And um, I think back at that a lot because, you know, I thought I wanted to be in, in public accounting. I became a CPA. Um, And the most important opportunity of my life was something that I had not dreamed of or even understood. Philanthropy was not a sector that was um, promoted during my uh, education uh, and my journey, but I was offered an opportunity to work for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and come into their finance uh, function at the time as controller. Um, And I was intrigued by the work of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation at the time. Uh, Many of you probably know the reputation was really strong. And as I learned more and more about the foundation, I felt like they were serving the exact children that I, that would represent myself. And I was one of those children, and now I was going to be given an opportunity to help further their mission and vision. So I took the opportunity to become the controller, and I thought five years would be plenty, and I would uh, work in their finance function, learn a lot, and then move on. Uh, And I didn't quite do that because last This month, I celebrated my 34th anniversary at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, So, of course, my plans were off a little bit. And and I do tell many young people, you do have to be open for opportunities that maybe you had not dreamt of, because um, I think this is exactly where I should be. It aligns perfectly with my passions, and uh, it is actually better than I would have imagined. But in the 34 years at the Kellogg Foundation, I was able to not only make an impact in the finance function, but I began to be offered opportunities within the foundation to work in other parts of the business and and grow in other parts of the business. And one of the first opportunities I was given was to help the foundation on its diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Uh, And this is an opportunity that I I think really shaped my career and my leadership because it wasn't an easy role. And many of you may know that the role of of bringing concepts of of race and and equity into uh, a business setting particularly, you know, 30, three decades ago was uh, an uncomfortable conversation. But because of my, I go back to my family upbringing and being number nine of 10 children, I had to be that voice. uh, And in order to be heard, I had to speak uh, with force. And I used that kind of strength that I gained from my family to begin to lead the effort in the Kellogg Foundation. And uh, it's been quite a journey. We've had great success. In fact, today, I'm so proud to say that the Kellogg Foundation is a leader in the field of this work on diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly in the philanthropic sector. And, and, And we do now refer to it as 
a pursuit of racial equity and racial healing. Because we know that in order to get to this place of racial equity in our nation and the world, we have to heal from the honest truths of our past, but use that as a way to bring people together and celebrate humanity as a collective. And that's been my journey and my leadership journey has been instilling that in, in our organization and in all of our work. And today we are very well represented. Our board is over 60% people of color and more than half women. Our foundation is 45% people of color and growing. Uh, very diverse and, and that environment has been one where everyone thrives and continues to contribute to the great work we do, uh, putting children at the center of everything we do. And, it, and that, I know the foundation, your foundation does do a lot of work um, to, well, teaching developing leaders and so te teaching leadership, um, but I'm imagining it is, it, that it's um, very much along the sort of collective and network leadership model rather than the, the single great person a leader. Um, and when I say that, I always think of the, the example from the worst days of apartheid when uh, there were the, 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 the funerals where the, the army would then open fire on the funerals and yet more people would be killed. And I remember the time when Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, one of your fellow um, Bynum Tudor fellows <laughs> at Kellogg College, uh, he was asked by the BBC commentator, uh, um, journalist, would, would you be prepared to uh, become a, a president of a post-apartheid South Africa? And uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu just laughed and said, no, Nelson Mandela will be our president, which was a, a great response given that Mandela was still in, um, in, in prison. Um, but, but could you say something about, about, about that, about the, the sort of uh, leadership that, that you encourage in, in sort of communities? Um, Absolutely. And, and that is it. We believe uh, that people have the inherent capacity to improve their own lives and their communities. So all of our fellows come from communities where they are leading um, and taking uh, ownership for the change and uh, the new vision that they have for themselves, their families and children. I remember when Desmond Tutu came to our office in, in Battle Creek, Michigan, he was um, a, a partner of ours and we, we just resonated with his leadership and his vision for what he wanted in South Africa. And the way that we work is because we know that leaders know best, we are not prescriptive. We don't go in and tell leaders what to do. We actually support leaders and lean into them. And our work in South Africa, as an example, just um, is a full example of what that looks like. When we came into South Africa, what we were told was leadership was the most important thing we could do because uh, a post-apartheid South Africa needed leadership, needed people, uh, black people to be able to step into these roles of ownership and leadership and do it with humility and humanity. And that's what our leadership is founded on is uh, believing in all people and bringing people together. Our community leadership network program, which we have today, is understanding that leaders cannot be isolated. Leaders should not have to work alone. Leaders need to be part of a network. They need to understand how to move and na navigate amongst many others and leverage the strength and abilities of all people. So uh, as we continue to learn on our own leadership journey, our leadership programs are enhanced by the wisdom and today, of course, we keep in touch with all of our leaders. We have over a thousand uh, of probably several thousand of leaders of our past programs who continue to be a part of a, an alumni network and to continue to contribute to our work and we learn from their work. Mm. 
And, and in terms of the, the sort of communities you're talking about, equitable communities, as, as you know, there's um, great synergies there with Kellogg College as well. Um, some people in, in the virtual meeting here might not realize that Kellogg College has, has just um, launched a, a commission on creating healthy cities, which should be um, socially sustainable as, as well as uh, environmentally sustainable and sustainable in terms of, of health and, and well-being. And um, that, that commission is being chaired by, by Lord Best and it's formed an international advisory board that I'm like to say that Lejeune Montgomery Tebron is a, is, um, a member of. Um, but I should give a special thanks to Lejeune for that because the last meeting, I know that it was four o'clock in the morning, her time. <laughs> That's one of, one of the problems with having international uh, international um, committees. Um, so obviously that, that commission's looking at healthy cities, like I say, in terms of, of um, health and social and environmental sustainability, but obviously there's there's um, strong synergies with what you're talking about, about having e equitable communities. Absolutely, yes. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when we talk about equitable communities today, uh, still in the middle of a pandemic, and uh, over the past year, 18 months, we've seen the devastated, devastating impact of the pandemic. But what's been very interesting for us has been um, the disparate outcomes coming out of the pandemic. And that I think is a testament to what we mean by creating equitable communities. When you look at, the outcomes of the pandemic, and you look at it from any vantage point, the deaths, uh, the jobs that were lost, uh, the health outcomes that were different, and uh, the access to health, uh, meet different types of health solutions, what we learned is uh, that was not an equitable process. Even when we first began to distribute vaccines, uh, those who were able to get vaccines were based on access and transportation, which were issues in communities that were not equitable. So we've learned during the pandemic, I think that uh, this pursuit for equi equitable communities and healthy outcomes is not only a pursuit for those who don't have it, but it's a pursuit for the entire community. And it's a way to actually build communities and thriving communities and, and frankly, economic vitality, not only for the community, but for the nation and the world. We've seen that disrupted as well. Uh, and so while we've been working in this space for 90 years now, it's moments like this that help us bring others into the conversation and leverage other voices, uh, other partners, because we're now seeing how devastating it can be when we don't have these healthy communities. Mm -hmm. And I was so honored to participate in the first meeting of uh, the healthy communities work globally. And what we're learning is in order to do this work, there has to be a, a, a construct or a way of measuring what is a healthy community? What does that look like? How do we create it? And that's some of the work that we're supporting at Brandeis University here in the United States is how we might measure healthy communities and how comprehensive that measurement must be and how, frankly, the measurement must look at the, the disparities. So it must look at race as a factor and determining whether those of all races are faring equitably. And so this new metric is just one way that the Kellogg Foundation can support the efforts to, to build these healthy, equitable communities all over the world. Yeah, I, I should say that uh, International Advisory Board meeting, uh, but I didn't realize that the representative from Latin America then uh, immediately recognized Lejeune, because uh, he'd previously been the WK Kellogg Foundation um, Latin American Program Officer and had uh, met you 10 or 20 years previously. Um, that was we're... excellent. We have our <laughs> Kellogg Fellows are everywhere and it's an honor to run into them and our former employees as well. So that was a great surprise. <laughs> 
Yes, and it's, it's always difficult to um, draw in comparisons internationally, but no, what you say about unequitable communities has certainly um, been brought home in Britain as well, and including in terms of the death rates, you know, from uh, from COVID and, and different communities, which is, you know, why, why it's so important. Um, if we could move on to um, another area, education, where we've got a lot of fellows and, and um, students uh, and alumni um, in the area of, of education. Um, the, the college sponsored something called the Centenary Commission on Adult Education, which is looking at adult education, um, lifelong learning, called the Centri Centenary Commission because um, just after the First World War in 1919, there had been a report on adult education stressing the importance of that and lifelong learning to rebuild society um, and the, the economy and, and individual well-being. I think an important point being that they weren't just narrowly focused on the economy as politicians today too often are, but did recognize that communities and individuals were, were important as well. Um, and um, the, the speaker before you in this series uh, is an um, art, art critic called Joan, Joan Bakewell, which is actually Dame Baroness Joan Bakewell, but she, uh, she asked not to be introduced like that because she comes from a, a working class, uh, uh, family in the, the north, uh, north of England and isn't bothered about um, titles. But she was a, a patron of the, that um, commission. And I remember when I wrote to her initially asking, asking her if she'd be a patron, she said, absolutely, of course, she's completely dedicated to the, the uh, um, principle of, of education because she remembered as a child, her parents doing adult education classes in the evening. And I've come across so many people like that uh, who remember their their parents doing adult education class in the evening, which has made them so passionate about um, education. So I think that does reinforce your point about the importance of families in, in education. And actually, just one other example of that, one of the commissioners, Uzo um, from Wales, said that they, they've got a better record in Wales at the moment for adult education and lifelong learning. They get lots of grandparents coming for education and technology and so on so they can communicate better with their grandchildren <laughs> so the whole intergenerational point is very important as well absolutely mr kellogg would always say education afforded the best opportunity to improve one generation over another uh, and we believe that fully and so you know that two generation approach is one that is very much present in a lot of our work and we've seen the fruits where you have parents and grandparents uh, being some of the first teachers of children uh, in our early childhood education work we talk about first teachers and we convene parents to make sure that they can be a part of the learning journey of the child but we also know uh, today that it may be a parent, it may be a neighbor, it's definitely many times a grandparent. And we're beginning to connect grandparents. And as you say, we see the learning both ways. The grandparents learn from the children and the children learn from the grandparents. And uh, it's that cycle of life that uh, is just so fulfilling when you see that happening real time. So absolutely. And now that I'm a grandparent recently, uh, I just can't wait to further uh, be a part of that cycle moving forward. Well, congratulations. And um, I could go on uh, go on uh, asking questions all, all evening, but um, I've been reminded by somebody putting a question in the chat, chat room that I should let other people um, get a word in edgeway. So um, Elizabeth has, uh, has, oh, it might be a message just to me, but anyway, Elizabeth, I've, I've seen your question. Liz Elizabeth, do you want to switch on your camera and your microphone and Ask Lejeune your question. Elizabeth? No. Yes, I, I, uh, um, I'm here. Um, uh, well, uh, I'm aware, uh, I'm aware, I mean, I'm sure this is true. I've never experienced it myself, but um, um, in the United States, um, black boys, Black boys, not black girls so much, but black boys, uh, young black boys are, are quite endangered in many um, inner city locations of major cities, uh, such as Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know about Battle Creek, Michigan. I've never lived there. I've lived many places in the United States, but I've never lived in Battle Creek. Um, I lived in Ann Arbor, but that I think is uh, 
that's a university town. It's a little different, but um, uh, anyway, um, I think in many major cities, um, I have excellent reason to believe that little boys grow up, black boys, not white boys, but black boys grow up not expecting to see their 17th birthday. Now, that sounds amazing to me, but I know that this is true. And it's not because of police brutality. I mean, that's the big public, public thing see now is that the police are going out shooting these kids, but they're not. That's not going on. They're, that's not it at all. What it is, is the um, uh, mainly it's the drug ridden nature of the community that causes um, uh, you know, an atmosphere where it, these kids get caught up in that and, and they get killed off. And um, I wondered if is the Kellogg Foundation doing anything to deal with that or do they not believe it exists or wh what is your position on that? Yes, we've been very much engaged uh, and it's multifaceted. It, it, it isn't one thing or the other, it's both and. And this is a case where there are many factors. Uh, but the most important factor, I think, is the lack of investment in education at our national, state, and local levels, and uh, the lack of opportunities that are given to these uh, people of color, young males. I have two sons who are uh, young Black boys, and you're right. Uh, uh, if it wasn't for the love and the hope and the encouragement that we continue to have to reinforce, uh, they're faced many times with uh, daunting experiences. Uh, and it is uh, partly uh, an issue of the criminal justice system, racial justice in the United States. And uh, my sons have definitely been impacted by policing that has been structurally biased against black boys. And, and that's a fact as well. So there are all these different factors, but most importantly, I think it takes a community approach. And that's what the WK Kellogg Foundation supports is bringing people together from all various sectors and, and places of the community to come and have a community conversation and to unpack some of these narratives and get to the root causes, the history of it, and then to form solutions that work for everyone. Uh, we have a particular program in the United States, we call it our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Effort. And it is about bringing people in community together, learning together, facing one another's humanity and affirming that, but then saying your truth and my truth can both exist. And if you say it's because of this issue and I say it's because of a different issue, let's look at all of these issues and let's create pathways and solutions and different policies that address these comprehensively. And that's the work that we're supporting uh, throughout the United States um, and seeing some great results of, of learning and healing. Because as I said before, I think a lot of this work is grounded in, in healing. And that is what, when I say healing, what I mean by that is when people come together, share their stories, share their backgrounds, learn other cultures and backgrounds and other truths, and then to shape all that into a, a space where all of those truths can be realized. And then to form policies together that address equality and opportunity for the future of their community. That's what healing is about. And when that happens, we're addressing these issues uh, that young black boys face and, and Asian American hate is real as well. We've seen that recently. We've seen LGBTQ hate. So all of these issues are present and it takes a collective approach, a community approach and some support uh, and resources that allow people to grow together and, and build trusting relationships. Great, thank you very much. We've got a, a few people wanting to ask. So Yasmin, can I turn to you next? So Yasmin, do you want to switch on your camera and your microphone and introduce yourself? Um, hello, hello, June. It's it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm I'm a historian based at Kellogg College and um, I'm currently senior tutor. And I, I just wanted to say that at Kellogg and in, in the university, we're grappling with some of these issues, certainly around um, 
race equity and uh, Kellogg I think is really trying to to kind of be a leading college in Oxford in that field in terms of appointing a fellow with special responsibility for that. Um, I'm also sitting on the university's race equality task force, which is trying to make a, a big intervention now um, in, in, in this area. And so I just, just wondered what, what you thought, how, how the best way to approach making a step change around um, uh, race justice and race equity is in, in an institution a big complex institution. Yes, like thank you for your question, Yasmin. And, and, and what I will say to you is um, it's, a, it's a journey, okay? There's not going to be just an immediate change overnight, uh, but it is a journey. And it's one uh, that starts, I think, with this space of, of awareness and learning and we have a, a, an effort that we're working on with corporate America in the United States. And what we learned uh, when we're working with corporate America, having the truth about their own environment really helped them to ground the work. And we have a partnership with McKinsey where we allow McKinsey to do some analytics some, and they go into the institution and they speak with uh, people of color, people who are different within the institution. And then what we're able to do is start with the truth about the institution that we wish to change. And then from that truth, begin to then think about what tools are available to address your particular issues. And what I can tell you is the healing work is going to be a part of anything you choose to do. And again, people think healing is squishy, uh, but it's really about trust building and bringing people together with a common understanding by which to then move forward with. And I think some of our healing work has been transformative in and of itself that leads to some of the, the best practices that be, get instituted in this space around equity. Um, and so I would, you know, we could talk more Jasmine, but I, I really think understanding that racial healing is at the heart of racial equity uh, is a fundamental understanding that grounds this work. Uh, because at the end of the day, people created the current systems. People either in their understanding or lack of understanding creates these systems, people, uh, perpetuate the systems. And to do this work, you have to start, I think, with the human being and the people and, and build uh, concepts of healing and one humanity by which we can then build stronger, uh, equitable opportunities in the future. Thank right. you very much. Yeah, th thank you. Um, John Hoffmeyer, do you want to switch your camera and um, microphone on and ask your question? John, John Hoffman. Yeah, the, the host has uh, made it impossible for me to use my camera, but I think I can still uh, ask this. So actually uh, on the screen, it just asked me to go ahead and start my video. Yeah. So here's, here's my, uh, my thanks and, and my question. Uh, well, June, I wanna thank you for being with us and answering Jonathan's questions and the other questions that you've received. And I wanna ask you to tell us about the Kellogg Foundation's involvement in impact investing. I know that Kellogg has been one of the leaders among foundations in this field. Will, will you describe to us how you support progressive businesses that fit your overall goals of helping working families and assisting children to thrive? Absolutely, John, and you did a great job yourself. Uh, but yes, um, we, so the Kellogg Foundation determined again, oh, almost about two decades ago, that we wanted to make greater impact than what we have today, which is a 5% distribution requirement. So we have all this wealth, and then of that 5%, we have to make charitable distributions. And we decided we wanted to make greater impact. And so we said, while we're making distributions with the 5%, what can we do with the 95%? And we decided that uh, chair, we could also invest 
uh, more equitably. We could use our investment dollars and, and walk our talk and speak our uh, vision and mission there. And so we created first a small portfolio and we wanted to test this concept of investing with impact. And what that meant was exactly what you said, John. It meant looking for companies in the business sector, in the for-profit sector, that were creating companies with a social conscious, companies that would improve outcomes for people in communities, be it that they may be led by people of color, they may be working on issues that people of color are facing or trying to address barriers to equity across the nation and the world, and that we wanted to support them in their endeavors. Uh, we looked at companies that were run by women and, and people of color, uh, educational interventions that would scale education outcomes, and we created a very diverse portfolio uh, to improve not only, you know, the outcomes that we were achieving, uh, but we talked about it as a, a double or even a triple bottom line. Uh, one would be the social outcomes. The second bottom line, of course, would be the profitability for that company as well as the W.K. Kellogg Foundation because we were taking equity investments. And then the third bottom line would be building wealth, building wealth of people who were being shut out of the wealth and the economic system, the financial sector. Uh, and that's been proving quite well. Uh, and we've had a lot of outshoots from that, uh, from our work there uh, that we're continuing to pursue, but it's been mission driven investing as we call it uh, and making all of our money work on behalf of our mission. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And I should say for anyone who's not noticed that, that um, Aralis from the W.K. Keller Foundation has kindly posted some of the links that Lejeune's been uh, referring to um, through to the Expanding Equity Initiative and the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation work. So if you go into the chat box, you can find those links. Now, um, Thank you, Aralis. Yeah. yeah. Joe, Joe Miller, do you want to switch on your microphone and camera and ask your question? Hi. Hello, um, lovely to come to this event this evening. Um, I just wanted to ask, I'm wanting to uh, ask about recruiting to leadership positions and how uh, the best way to optimise for really diverse applicants at, at a very senior level of leadership when you're um, advertising for those roles. Thank you for your question, Joe. And yes, it's uh, something that we've been perfecting along our journey. Uh, if you look at our leadership today is very diverse, um, but that wasn't always the case. And so a couple things that I can tell you we've done differently uh, as we have learned. The recruitment firm, I think, is, is a very important partner in this work. And uh, we've had to find firms who were aligned with our mission and purpose. Uh, and so we went on a journey where we found, at first we could not find a firm that had a network of diversity that we could rely upon to bring those diverse candidates. Early in our process, we thought, well, maybe if we partnered uh, a non-diverse recruitment firm with a, a minority owned firm and have them work together. Maybe that would work. So that happened on our journey and we had some success, but it was a little clumsy. But more recently, we found some outstanding firms that have built very diverse networks. And I think that's the first question to ask of any recruitment partner is, what are their networks and how strong and deep and diverse they are? Because if they aren't, uh, you're not going to have the benefit of that. So that's been one piece. And I think the second part of it is uh, we are very active uh, on our own right, on our website, et cetera, really espousing to the environment that we're trying to create at the Kellogg Foundation and the type of leadership that we're looking for. And I think that plays a part as well. Uh, and, you know, of course, in the recruitment effort, people need to see themselves uh, 
in the organization and see that there's opportunity to thrive there. And we make sure we have that level of representation throughout the organization. Great. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Jill June. Thank you very much. So Christine, Christine Jackson, you want to switch on your microphone and camera and ask your question? Hi, Christine. Hi. Hello, Lejeune. It's Hello. terrific to have you here with us this afternoon. Um, I'm a historian and an emeritus fellow of Kellogg. I wondered if I could swing attention um, slightly in a different direction, because I wondered what value you found with mentors and role models in your own life and also in your programs, and whether that sort of has an impact on the, the work you do. It absolutely does, Christine. Thank you for the question. Um, I have been mentioning lately one of my mentors, uh, and I mentioned to Jonathan early, one of our former president CEOs of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation passed away this past week, and he was a very strong uh, supporter and mentor of mine. And the first thing I would say in this space is uh, mentorship and sponsorship is key, I think, for anyone's growth and development. And uh, what we're finding a lot in the United States is for people of color, particularly, they don't exist in, in greater numbers. Uh, but when I think about Bill Richardson, Dr. Richardson and his mentorship of me, uh, just a small story that I share, and I'll have to do it quickly, but as president and CEO, he, he saw me, even though I was sitting in that controller seat in a corner of the finance function, uh, but he saw me and, and convinced me to see myself as something more and, and bigger. And one day he was asked to write a chapter in a philanthropic publication. And he actually came to me and asked me if I would partner with him to write this chapter because he knew that it would be a way to expose me to greater opportunities. And so he and I partnered on this chapter. And when we were done, he came back to me and said, okay, we're done, we're gonna publish and I'm gonna put your name first because that's the way it should be. And you should know that in, 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 in these settings, the name and the order of the names make a difference. And so I'm gonna put your name first. And he did, uh, and uh, really allowed me to grow in the philanthropic sector and be known beyond my own foundation. But that's just an example of how important I think mentorship mm -hmm. and sponsorship is. And yes, we support that throughout our own foundation as well as through our leadership work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. N Niall, Niall Winters, and switch your microphone on and camera. Yeah, I think I'm having a, a similar problem to the previous one, but not been able to turn on my camera, but uh, I'll speak anyway. Hopefully you can, you can, you can hear me. Oh, here we go. It's working now. Hi. Hello. It's been very, very interesting so far. Um, my research interest is in, in education, a lot of technology in, in education at, um, at Kellogg. And so I was interested in your perspective or the work Kellogg's been doing, particularly with schools, um, as a result of the impact of COVID-19 and particularly in communities of color where the impact leads to sort of multiple marginalizations. And so I wonder, could you speak to how you've addressed that? And the yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, so we, we talk about this work as, you know, during the pandemic relief, there's like the immediate relief and then there's the recovery and then there's the rebuilding and the repair. Um, when we first encountered the pandemic, relief for us was about getting technology to children uh, and families. And so we talked about this digital divide. We've all understood the concept of a digital divide and then all of a sudden COVID hit and when education became virtual, we could clearly see that those uh, in urban settings, many under-resourced under schools uh, did not have the technology. The families did not have internet uh, capability, uh, access. And uh, there was a, a deep divide in the infrastructure technologically for 
education to continue. So we invested uh, and, and partnered with other uh, funders, for example, in many, in some of our communities to just put laptops and tools in the hands of every student, every household to expand broadband uh, capability in communities that did not have it. Uh, to give people free internet for the next year or six, 18 months. So that was kind of the relief effort. Um, but one of the other things that I will say that has been disturbing for me in education, we believe that the earliest uh, intervention of a child while the brain is developing is some of the most critical time for, for education. And so we have an entire effort, which is age zero to age eight, really focusing on the early uh, interventions and child, early childhood development. And one area of education that I think was decimated through COVID is early childhood development, the child care centers many in child care centers were just ended during this pandemic. And the providers of those centers have not come back. Uh, what we learned is they're woefully underpaid and actually could make more money in the relief efforts than they can in this most important job of developing and caring for the youngest children. So we have, uh, and I'll just give you one example in the city of Detroit, uh, we started out on an effort to build quality early child care seats for every child in the city. Before the pandemic, we had a gap of about 28,000 seats. After the pandemic, that number is now 42,000 seats. Uh, so we've gone backwards and we can't, the providers are not coming back. So there's an effort now to, to elevate the importance of the providers and the infrastructure for early childhood education, which we believe is the best investment in a child's educational journey. So that's the type of work that we're doing today before the pandemic, but most certainly now doubling down after the pandemic. Great to hear Great. very much. Thank you. Now, Lajuna, I realize we've gone over time and I don't want to keep you from your lunch, <laughs> but uh, would you have time for one last question? Sure. Great, because Chris, Chris Riley, I know you've been waiting patiently. So do you want to put your microphone and camera on and ask your question? Yeah, I, sh I think stop my video should be working. There we go. See, uh, well, like a lot of people, I'm outside. <laughs> 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 Following the COVID regulations, of course. Anyway, I want to just uh, reiterate um, the comments from people earlier. Thank you very much for giving up your time. Um, it's been a great talk so far. And um, as normal, Jonathan stolen my question uh, earlier, um, which was about your leadership journey. Uh, I was going to ask you about that, which but, but being quick on my feet, I've been jotting down another one, which is given your views of, of leadership, which is, as Jonathan framed it, the opposite almost to the great, great person view of, of leadership. It's more grounded and bottom up. How, and I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to this myself. So that's why I'm asking you. How do we teach that sort of leadership given the dominance, particularly in business schools, even in Oxford, of, of the great person view of leaders? You know, it's the Elon Musk's of the world, um, Richard Branson's, God help us, Boris Johnson. Um, or it might be framed as charismatic, authentic, or servant leadership, but it's always top down. Right. So a long question. I'm sure you've got a nice pithy answer, which is how do we do it? How do we reverse the telescope of leadership? So um, thank you for that question. And I agree with you that um, you have to leadership is is plentiful in my uh, view of leadership. And mm. We, we have some concepts at the Kellogg Foundation that I think, you know, I don't have your total answer as you were saying, but there are a couple concepts that we lean into. One is to look for what, what we call the formal leader, leader and the informal leader. 
So mm -hmm. the formal leader may be those people who you mentioned, you know, great presence uh, and, you know, formal titles and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those that we know. And then the informal leader is those that people resonate with, those that people listen to. And it's an interesting way to find those. I, I had one of my board members would go into a community, watch all the people present, but watch where the eyes turned. And, and that's where we would find those informal leaders. And it turns out that the informal leaders have much greater influence and impact and fellowship. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is something that we look for in all of our work at the Kellogg Foundation, even in our leadership programs. When we uh, look for new candidates in our program, we always look for those informal leaders. And we have specific questions that we ask to see if mm. we can find those informal leaders. Uh, mm. I think the other thing is the concept of being leaderful or leaderful. Uh, and that everyone is a leader and, and how do you tap into the gift that they bring and where their passion lines up where they can actually take on a leadership role. So for us, leadership and ownership are closely connected and, and how do you bring everyone into that space and when they find that sweet spot, people light up and become leaders that you never would have imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about finding alignment and passion, and it's about both the formal and the informal leader. That's great. Thanks very much. And I'll just share one comment before Jonathan stops me, uh, which is, I think the COVID crisis, we talk about silver linings earlier, you've hit the nail on the head, because that's what it's sort of thrown up. It's thrown up the, as, as an article in the Financial Times put it, accidental leaders. Yes. Particularly during the first lockdown, all these people emerged and were taking on leadership roles. They weren't formal leaders. They were accidental leaders. And that, I thought that stuck with me when I read that. Mm -hmm. And if COVID hadn't had happened, they would never, never have emerged, really. But thank you for your, for your great answer. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, Lejeune, thank you. And I'm pleased to say your, your, your other colleague, Mary, has uh, also uh, posted some further information in the mm. chat box for everyone to follow up, the extra links being put in there. Um, so Lejeune, um, on behalf of everyone at, at Kellogg, can I, Kellogg College, I should say, <laughs> can I th thank you so much for having uh, taken the time to join us uh, today. I would say how pleased we are that you've uh, joined the Kellogg College fellowship and community and how much we're all looking forward to welcoming you to the college this time next year when everyone will get a chance to really engage with you far more fully so in the meantime well in the meantime Lejeune is there anything any final words you wanted to say to everybody before we sign off? I just want to thank you Jonathan uh, for your leadership of the Kellogg College and its continued uh, relevance and uh presence and I'm looking forward to joining you next year this time so that I can meet you all face to face or many of you so thank you for this invitation I look forward for a long-term partnership great excellent well thank you thank you very much and thank you everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you this time next year if not before <laughs> thank, you. thank you bye everybody bye bye everyone